Your mate's car is turbo, your neighbours have turbos, your nan might even have a turbo car these days. So, all you want is a little of that turbo barra power that everyone's talking about, but it looks like you've missed the boat with prices going through the roof and you'll be stuck with your NA barra. But what if you could leave the NA engine you have and turbo it pretty much as is? In this episode, we'll show you how to yank all of this non-spooly boy stuff off and get your NA barra looking a lot more like this. Welcome back into Brownie's Garage. A lot of you have followed me through the NA mods on this car and I really enjoyed it for what it is. But it's time for more power and some turbo noises. I'll be splitting the conversion into each system as we go through the video, so it's in somewhat of an order. The way I'll be doing it could be done in any NA BA or BF Falcon, not just an XR6 like ours and will be similar to later FGs as well. And if you had everything ready, I'm sure you could knock this out in one day, depending on your method. However, I'm filming it all, I'm not a mechanic, and I'm just plain slow at working on cars in general. So, this will happen over many days, and I'll likely look to have aged a lot by the end of this video. With that in mind, I will mention some alternative options for how to do certain things or parts to use, but won't cover all of them, or this video itself would go for days, and I'm far from the first person to do this, so there are plenty of other resources out there. I'll give the exact part numbers and prices in a video and list later, once I'm happy everything is working as it should, but I'll also try to include links to parts and certain tools used in this video in the description down below. Fingers crossed we can stay under our $3,000 budget that I've set for this. It might be tough though. And this budget is a consideration in some of the decisions and parts used, as well as keeping to our other goals outlined in the first episode, being to keep the conversion fairly simple for the hacks like me to do at home, getting a good bump in performance still, but balancing all of those with keeping it fairly reliable. This is in no way an all out big power way of doing things, nor is it a focused track car. I've decided on a risk level I'm happy with and have a somewhat conservative power goal that we could improve on in the future. Part of that will act as testing for you at home and this car isn't a daily, so I haven't taken every precaution that you would with unlimited time or money. But I also don't want it to blow up, so some precautions in the right areas are being taken. Let's be honest, these things could get out of control really quickly. And being an average hack, there's bound to be stuff I miss or mess up, but I have worked incredibly hard to research and work through issues as much as I can to help any of you doing this at home as well. Let's use the comments as a resource as well and to share some NA plus T experience. Okay, that's the disclaimer stuff out the way. I'm gonna fire this thing up and take it for a short final drive as an NA car off camera, then, We'll get stuck into work. I find the best way to start work on something like this is to go for a little drive. So everything is super hot and you have to wait for it to cool. And I wonder why things take me so long. Not an issue for me this time though. I'm starting by jacking up the car then removing the ECU. The heads of the bolts for these are designed to snap off during install at the factory at a specific torque rating to make them tamper proof, but thankfully not idiot proof, so I can still get these out. A slot is carefully cut in the middle of the head for a flat screwdriver bit. I've had mixed success with this. Some caveman techniques with vice grips and a chisel have been an okay alternative when this fails. 
Removing this isn't entirely necessary, but I'm a long way from the tuner we'll use, so limping it there without hitting boost on the stock tune isn't an ideal option. But there are people who have managed this and kept downtime for the car to a minimum. Not going to a turbo ECU goes back to our cost and ease of conversion goals, because factory turbo ECUs and the extras we'd need to add with it are only going up in price, and it does add some small complications. At our power level, it would still be ideal, but not hugely different, and it's definitely not a must have. Staying with the NA ECU, we can still read boost and be tuned for this, and all the usual engine controls like timing and fuel, but it won't have electronic boost control like a factory turbo ECU would in this third blank spot here. I'll be sending this off to our tuner to get a base tune for the new setup we'll have in this car, so we can fairly safely drive it over there. I won't be driving it hard on this tune, and doing it this way may cost a little extra for that base tune, but this will allow us to test for issues or leaks, to set the car up with things like the new map sensor and fuel pressure regulator you'll see soon, that on a stock tune won't run well or at all with these. And it then saves us a little money on having the shop do these for us or us trying to do it in the driveway at the front when we get there. We'd be without the ECU for some time. As mentioned though, the car won't run on the ECU anyway as it'll be reprogrammed for some parts we're yet to change. Oh, and because of this, or at very least, if it did run, I'd have some pretty ticked off neighbours. I've taken the chance to remove most of the NA parts I won't be using. Removal has been covered for a lot of this in our NA series, so check those videos for more details if you need them. The NA intake is removed first, leaving our custom shop airbox, pod filter and piping end. Exhaust was then removed, starting from the rear first and using a heap of penetrant spray to stop any of the bolts snapping. I've treated myself to this $25 eBay exhaust hanger removal tool. Any tool that cheap that can save time on your back under a car is a huge win in my book, and those hangers can be a real pain. The steering shaft is also unbolted to move it out the way a little, a step only needed with aftermarket headers like our pacemakers, which are then removed from the top, once the oxygen sensor I forgot about is also unplugged. While I was making more room, the thermo fans were also removed. For two bolts and some wiring, it's easy, but not entirely needed. And the front bumper was then also removed. I've covered this more in our transmission cooler install video and had to do it quite a few times for this channel. It's so nice when those plastic scrivets that mostly hold this on work, but I hate the stupid things as they normally don't. No going back now. That's the big parts and that's as stripped out as it will get. We'll have a few other bits that will be straight swapped as we go. It's for now left us plenty of room down the exhaust side. So let's jump into drilling the sump for our oil return. Our NA sump has the casting for the oil return that turbos use, but it hasn't been drilled or tapped. I'll be reusing a factory oil return, so we'll set it up for this. To start, I've marked and centre punched where the two bolt holes need to be from a gasket, centred on this casting location. Easy enough, but we have an extra complication when it comes to drilling on car thanks to our limited space. I've solved this with an eBay spec 90 degree drill attachment, none of which I could find with a drill chuck large enough for the bit we need in a minute, so I also ordered a larger chuck and swapped this on. I've then drilled these as straight as possible with a 6.5mm drill bit and only to a depth of roughly 16mm. We don't want to drill right through on these as it's not needed and just gives another location for oil leaks. A thread is then tapped into these using an M8 by 1.25 tap to suit our bolts. Pretty basic thing, but making a thread appear where there wasn't one before is still some sort of low level magic to me. We then need to drill the centre drain hole through to the sump. I've done a full video testing on this and if any metal is pushed into the sump doing it. Check that out for more info if this worries you, and come to your own conclusion as to whether you feel comfortable doing this on the car. Lessons learnt from my testing are mainly to use a heap of grease on the drill bit to catch metal, clean the drill bit and change this grease often, Go slow drilling so you don't eject this grease or metal, and tape off the drill bit roughly 20 millimeters from the very tip so that it won't go in too far. I can now put this practice to use and drill out the oil return with a new sharp 13 millimeter drill bit and a lot of patience. 
Once that's done, I've dropped the oil, then flushed it through a few times more to collect any of the hopefully very little metal that made it into the pan. This could be done with the old oil if well strained, with new cheapo oil, or it's even been suggested that some diesel might be good for this job. Only one little piece of metal has been strained out using this method, which pretty well reflects my testing results. Hopefully a sign that we did well enough to get very little in the sump. I've left the oil filter and filled the engine with some good clean oil before I forget. We'll run this car very briefly with this when we're ready, then do another full oil and filter change and I'm confident we'll be okay on this from there. We'll wait until more is on before fitting the oil return line. I've left tape over this for now so it's not open. Another quick job to do on this side is to move this power cable down lower in the shock tower. The factory turbo cars do this as well because it would be right beside your turbo if left in this location. With that out the way, let's move back over to some of those NA parts I've left on and look at our fuel system. This is an area where I've spent a little money on new parts to take some precautions. Without good fuel supply or proper tuning of it, we could pretty quickly lean out the engine and damage it. But it really isn't much that needs to be spent if staying with reasonable power goals. The turbos run a slightly higher fuel pressure due to an upgraded fuel pressure regulator up to 4 bar from 2.7 in the NA. I've got a second one here in a fuel rail that I got as a deal along with a heap of the other factory used parts you'll see from someone wrecking a factory turbo car. These regulators do seem pretty reliable, but for $70 brand new, I figure I'd play it super safe. Gives me an easy way of showing how to swap these though. There's a large clip that goes through here to hold the regulator in, just pull it out. The regulator will likely be pretty stuck, so use some penetrant spray with a bit of twisting to break it free, then work it side to side and lift it out. New one can be pushed in with just a touch of oil to lubricate the seal and push our clip back on. The rest of the fuel system is dead simple. It's done. The turbos and NA cars share the same injectors, with the extra fuel demands of the turbo being accounted for with the increased fuel pressure at the regulator. If in good condition, this setup could probably support somewhere up to 250 rear wheel kilowatts or so at a push. I've read that the turbos may also have a slightly better fuel pump, but couldn't find figures to back this up. And if you've been watching along, You'll know that in an earlier episode, I've gone a little cautious on this anyway by upgrading to a Walbro 255 like this one we have here. Not a huge step up, but it will support plenty of power, doesn't require any further mods to suit like wiring upgrades, and we can now be fairly confident that the potentially two decade old fuel pump won't give up on the first power run on the dyno for all of about $110. If only it was all that easy. Let's work up to a job I'm not looking forward to with one we've shown a little of before. The plugs we have in this car are still relatively new. We showed how to do this in our final dyno prep video for the NA series. And we may well get away with using these, especially if we gap them down a little, but a new set is only around $60. That's a lot cheaper than having spark issues on the first hard dyno run and having to pay for the shop to swap them, and I thought it was important to mention, as they can get overlooked. I learnt that lesson recently on the ignition coils which died on me, and looked to be the originals from some 17 years ago. Now would be a good time to replace these if they're getting pretty old, as I've done earlier. The genuine Ford coils are super reliable and will suit most setups except for those perhaps at the more extreme end of the power and boost settings. For spark plugs, I'll also be using genuine Ford, but to suit gas engines, which come pre-gapped to 0.7mm. It's probably a tighter gap than necessary, especially at our power level, but this gap seems to be used a lot on higher power cars, will hopefully do as well also, and is another small insurance. Let's hope I haven't changed these and need to pay the shop to change them again. I'll leave that coil cover off for the next job we're about to move on to. The one I've been slightly dreading. The factory map or manifold air pressure sensor, as you may guess, detects the air pressure in our intake. 
On these NA cars, it's listed at one bar or around 14.5 PSI and has a range that can actually read up to more like 1.18 bar. Sounds like plenty, except until you consider that we exist in Earth's atmosphere, which has that air already at around 14.7 PSI of pressure. If we compress that air further, as we do with boost, we'll very quickly be past that limit. So we need to install a sensor that won't be maxed out and allow the ECU to see boost. We can do this with a factory turbo map sensor, referred to as a two bar map sensor. These have a range closer to 2.5 bar or around 21, 22 PSI of boost pressure. Plenty for what we need, but there's one more trick. The wiring for a BA or BF turbo map sensor is slightly different and so won't plug straight into our NA car. There are adapters that you can buy for this, but for a similar price to that adapter alone, you can pick up a brand new FG turbo sensor that will read the same as our other one and plug straight in. Now, if you don't have the ECU tuned yet and you need the car to run and drive again, say to load onto a trailer or to limp to your tuner, you better to do this later as the car won't drive once we put this new sensor in. If I got anything wrong in that explanation, I'm sorry, I'm learning more on this part as I go. But we definitely need that upgraded sensor. None of that nerdy stuff is what I've been dreading though. The tight and fiddly space where that sensor is, is the issue. The map sensor on these cars is located under the throttle body attached to the intake manifold. There's four 5mm Allen head bolts holding this on that can be a little tough to get at. I've picked up this long impact hex bit which works with a quarter inch hex socket from Bunnings to make this easier and hopefully save me banging up the rocker cover in the process. Unplug the wiring, remove the throttle body and save your gasket if it's in good condition. These are reusable. We can then just see the map sensor buried in there. Go ahead and remove the one bolt holding it in. Easier said than done. I've used a combination of short sockets and then spanners when I ran out of room for that. Oh, and it's one of those super common 7mm head bolts for some reason, so hope you have tools for that. While pulling it out, disconnect the wiring and try to keep it somewhere you'll be able to get easily. Our new sensor has an O-ring already fitted. I've applied a tiny bit of lubricant to this. If you're using a second-hand sensor, check this O-ring is still in good condition or replace it. Then reconnect the wiring, carefully work the sensor in position and spend far too long getting the bolt back in. Just barely nip this back up to hold it in. While I finish that, you may be wondering why I'm not changing to a turbo intake manifold. This is where the proper pain in the butt job is. It's another part that I can hopefully save you guys needing to buy, and if you're getting the idea that I'm avoiding swapping it over, then you'd be right. The difference between these is the butterfly valves, like small throttle plates, which each of the six intake runners has in the NA version. The ECU controls these through a vacuum switch that blocks the short runners at low RPM and then opens them at higher RPM. The turbo version is the same but without these butterflies and the controls for it at the front. To get close to this turbo manifold with little work, I'll disconnect the vacuum. This leaves the butterflies open and closer to the turbo version, only with something similar to six small open throttle blades. Not perfect, but simple. For now, I'll finish off by capping the openings left on the manifold and control valve for the ECU with 4mm vacuum caps. You may like to cap off the vacuum source for these at the intake manifold rear, but I'll be using this vacuum source later on. Okay, maybe that wasn't so bad. Enough talking about the remnants of our NA setup. Let's get into the big ticket item that makes, or breaks, our dreams. For the turbo, you can get new, hopefully bolt-on versions of the factory turbo, ranging in price from eBay copies to Pulsar turbo versions, which are getting really popular and are well-priced, up to, of course, brand new Garrett turbos. We've instead gone with a genuine second-hand unit that seems to be in good condition. This is from a later FG XR6 turbo and commonly referred to as a GT3576. It won't support quite as much max power as the GT3582 that all BA and BF turbos had, as well as FPV versions of the FG. 
Fine for us because that means people get rid of them at reasonable prices to upgrade and it will still support more than we are after. Luckily, they'll still bolt straight up to our factory BA, BF stuff. Once the front and rear housings have been freed up to rotate so the oil drain is facing directly down when mounted, the intake moved to line up with the different piping routes of the early models and wastegate actuator mount lined up with the wastegate flapper pin again then locking it all down. Okay, so it's a bit of a pain with the exhaust side being hard to get loose, and I'll likely have to adjust it a few times to get it exactly right, but nothing too scary. May cover this and a trick I came across more in a short video if there's enough interest. Another trade-off for having less max potential power is it will give a slightly quicker spool. Great for bringing power in early and feeling quick on the street, but uh, that's also kind of bad for the weak bottom ends in these cars because the more torque and quicker boost comes in, the more stress it'll be under. Should be more than fine with our power goals though. And one downside of the simple boost control we'll be using, we'll somewhat balance this out anyway. On that, I mentioned earlier that we won't be using a turbo ECU to control boost. So how will we control it? Well, it doesn't get much simpler than this for boost control. This is an upgraded Turbo Smart wastegate actuator, IWG75, and should bolt straight on. The wastegate on these turbos are internal, which put basically is an inbuilt bypass valve and port within the turbo housing that redirects exhaust gas away from the turbine, controlling how fast it spins and the boost that it makes. These are a little restrictive in how much can be flowed even stock, and it's a fairly common job to upgrade to a bigger valve and open up the port for more flow to prevent overboosting. Our wastegate actuator controls this and is referenced to the amount of boost being made through a vacuum or boost line off the turbo housing with no other controller or electronics needed. Not having an electronic boost controller will actually work against that slightly smaller turbo a little in that it could slow the spool up time. Without a controller between the boost in the compressor housing and the wastegate actuator, the actuator sees exactly whatever boost is being made and reacts to it by slightly more gradually opening as it builds pressure against the spring inside, rather than holding closed to help build boost, then quickly opening when the controller allows it to. Not ideal for spool speed and other controls, but good for our little rods. The factory wastegates I believe are pretty reliable, but they're really getting up there in age, deal with a lot of heat, and I'd have to imagine the springs or seals will fatigue at some stage. It's a common upgrade too when modifying or turning these cars up, so it's not really wasted if we go after more power later. And the last factor for these, unlike the factory ones, these aftermarket units can be opened up to replace the spring and upgrade to a range of options from factory spring setting of around four and a half to five PSI to the more common seven or 12 PSI right up to, are you sure you want that much boost levels? All a fairly bolt on, bolt off deal, except for setting the preload on the new actuator, which will hold the wastegate shut. Turbo Smart instructions list this as being two millimeters, meaning the rod needs to be adjusted in length to two millimeters short of fitting over the wastegate pin. I've then used some compressed air with the pressure turned right down to 10 PSI or so, threw an old bike tire valve to open the actuator and slip the rod end on. So that's our turbine boost control, but we need to install that as part of the rest of the exhaust side of the car. Well, get to it already. It's time to make this look like something that will run again. You may be able to reuse some of your NA exhaust if this has been upgraded, but I'm nearly certain that none of it will be a straight bolt up and you'll have to get some cutting and welding done to make it work. All for an exhaust that will be a restriction really quickly. It's probably best to just sell off your upgraded NA exhaust and recover some money, or almost certainly better to just bin the factory NA exhaust altogether if that's what you have. I've opted to really dig into the secondhand parts bin for this section. Our full exhaust, dump pipe, turbo manifold, and heat shielding will all be factory turbo gear from a BA or BF Falcon and should fit up nicely. What I have spoiled myself with a little in new parts are studs and gaskets. Okay, not the most exciting, but some of the exhaust bolts are notorious for backing out and needing to be checked regularly. 
If I can eliminate that, then bonus. Oh, and I was missing some of the hardware needed anyway. I've gone with a full stud kit from Mumba. A little under $200 for these hurt, but if it saves me time or lost performance from bolts falling out, it's worth it to me. Up to you if it's worthwhile. Our exhaust manifold gasket is relatively new, reusable, and showed no issues, so that one is staying and isn't included in the kit I've used. Next is the turbo manifold. This is a simple log manifold style made from cast steel. Being cast from factory, it's nice and thick and not prone to cracking or damage. Not the prettiest thing, and sure, there are more optimal designs out there, but a quick look online shows plenty of cars going 400 plus rear wheel kilowatts with these. It'll be just fine for us, and with heat shields on, we'll look tidy enough. I'll do a final fit of these later. Don't forget the heat shield for the engine mount as well, if you have it. From the factory, the manifold to turbo and to dump pipe didn't have gaskets, but I figure these parts have done a ton of heat cycles and been through who knows how many hands now, so some gaskets to help seal any leaks can't hurt. Then the turbo goes in, and out, and in, until I think I have the housings clocked right. I've gone ahead and bolted the coolant lines on to make that easier before final fit up. More on that soon. I've also had to cut down one of the studs so I can get the nut tightened down and my tool back out. This is probably more like the third or fourth time fitting this. If I did it again, I'd definitely bolt everything onto the manifold and turbo at the bench, then put it in as a whole assembly. The factory dump pipe is now fitted to the back of the turbo with the oxygen sensor already fitted. Similar story to the manifold here it seems. Not the prettiest or ideal with more power, but can support well in excess of what we want. Off the dump pipe we have one of the most commonly upgraded parts on these cars, the factory cat section. These seem to be a bit of a restriction and are commonly swapped out for a high flow cat early on when chasing more power. Not a bad option if a factory second hand one can't be found at a reasonable price or if you want more power immediately, but be mindful that with nearly any exhaust mod on these cars, they can become prone to overboosting and damage engines, especially the case if still running the standard flapper valve and porting on the wastegate port of your turbo, as mentioned earlier. The rest of the factory turbo exhaust follows that, again, good for plenty of power and seems to be holding up really well for its age. It will also be fairly quiet, which suits me just fine for now. I'd rather hear some turbo noises for something different, but if I don't do the next step, it's going to be all the wrong turbo noises I'm hearing. You'll have already seen that I've gone with some aftermarket coolant lines, which are from Mumba on eBay again. The factory turbo lines that run around the block have an extra provision for a joiner hose and hard lines for this, but good luck trying to find them. And if you do, they look like a pain in the butt to swap over anyway. More options are being developed for this, I think, but for $85, we have these braided lines, and I'm going to attach these in line with the hose running from the top of the thermostat to the overflow. Not the prettiest, but it's dead easy, gets coolant flow, and will work just fine for now. I may tidy this up later. I'd considered trying this by putting T fittings in the heater lines at the firewall, like those used on LPG models, but it's not a whole lot cleaner, requires more fittings, and would have the lines running alongside more sections of exhaust. Onto the oil lines, I've picked up an Ants performance kit for this, but there are loads of similar options. This is one of those things that's a common upgrade anyway, to something decent quality with a bigger inline serviceable filter, and then make sure you do regularly service it. The factory hard lines had issues with getting blocked with buildups of cooked oil, then starving the turbo of oil, which is apparently bad. Our oil supply will be teed into the oil temperature sensor here, above where the oil filter would normally be. Simple enough, and most info you'll find recommends using 3.8 BSP fittings for this. Enough people have done this, so I have no doubt it works, but there have been some blues on the internet, shocking I know, about whether this requires BSP or NPT fittings. Sometimes I get a bit OCD about this stuff, so I've spent far too much time learning what the hell these are and piecing together everything needed for either. As an idiot still on the subject, this is what I've concluded. There are only very small differences between the thread styles at this size, but most importantly and clear to see, in person anyway, are the threads per inch, with NPT at 18 and BSP at 19. 
Not a huge difference, but a difference even in a smallish section of thread. And by matching these to our sensor, the NPT is the winner. With that out of the way, until people yell at me in the comments at least, I've assembled the pieces of our T and sensor at the bench with the use of some thread sealant. This is then threaded back into the block. The first oil feed line can be attached and run around the front of the engine. The adapter fitting is bolted into the top of the turbo, then the line from this and finally the inline filter attached. The turbo drain will be bolted up to the underside of the turbo and pan later. I'm leaving this off for now until our first fire up to check that we have oil flow through our turbo. Okay, so none of this section is particularly fun or pretty, so I've splashed out on a line holder for these. It's also kind of a practical thing, but I could have achieved similar with some well-placed cable ties. Another OCD thing, it's the only aeroflow part on this setup, and while they make quality parts, it seems silly to then have their branding front and center, so I flipped it around to the plain black back. There really is something wrong with me, you know? And that's why I'll need to sort the huge excess length of the coolant lines at some point. Ignore it for now, we need to push on. We're now dangerously close to our first startup, but I wanted one more section done before I lose the last few of you who have made it this far. The intakes and all of the piping are something that many will opt to upgrade while they're in there. A little for performance, but mostly for sound and appearance. The factory stuff should again support what we need though, and it's what I'll mostly go with. We do already have a custom shop airbox and pod filter set up in the stock airbox location, so that might as well stay. The turbo and NA airboxes are the same anyway, I believe, except for the slightly larger intake snorkel on the turbo. For fitment of the crossover section, there are three mounting points on this. These two on one side are already there and used on the factory NA setup. There's one more on the rocker cover. It's there, but not tapped yet. So out came my new favorite tool, the tap and die set again, and an M6 by 1.0 tap is used. You may get away without these mounts and plenty have, but it's easy enough to set these up. The only small complication is the use of these spaces between the crossover and the mounts to get the right height. Not a big deal, except these are 25 bucks each from Ford. And that's if you can get them. They don't even come with the cap nuts for that price. Instead, I've sourced these rubber isolators that do the same job, only set me back $15 for four, and we can pair these with factory bolts that held our NA piping down once a little length is cut off them. The crossover will also have our factory blower valve hidden down the back. Before I make this harder for myself, I've removed the old vacuum source for the intake manifold runner switch. A new vacuum hose will be run to this for that blower valve. A new silicon joiner has been used from this to the throttle body, and I picked up some really nice black clamps from Weldspeed to go on this. Similar clamps should have come with the complete intake setup I bought, but didn't. Don't feel like me, and make sure to check for these things. Nice touches nonetheless. Rocker cover breather and blower valve are hooked up. Then the airbox to crossover piping is fit up to finish this side of the intake crossover and thanks to YouTube magic, no time at all has passed and our retuned ECU is back and can be installed using some new tamper encouraging hardware. That's where we'll finish up for this video. Okay, not quite. I teased a first start with the turbo and I can't leave it without this so I promise we'll finish on that in a second. Bit by bit, we have a near complete turbo engine bay now, but something is missing. Oh yeah. Sorry, but surprisingly, I think installing this intercooler up front may take a little more time than it would first seem. At least with trying to keep all the other oil coolers and hopefully showing how to install a factory or slightly upgraded cooler like our eBay cheapo we have here. Plus, I want to get a video out to show you all what I've been up to. You're going to have to stick around to the next episode to see this finished off, and maybe even our first test drive. But right now, I'm going to pull the fuel pump relay and crank the car to get some oil flow quickly. Then we'll try starting it and hopefully see that turbo spin for the first time on this car. Before I do that though, I put this tape on a long time ago as a dumb joke, but it's not going to last in any real heat and it's time to take things a little more serious anyway. There, now we're ready. All right. 
so our turbo has oil. Let's see if she'll start. Oh yeah, we've nearly done a thing. That's a good start, but make sure you subscribe to see us finish this conversion in the next episode. Support the channel by liking the video if you've enjoyed it and share it with a mate. I'm gonna shut this off before I die from all the exhaust smoke and run it out of oil, clean my mess, and get to work in getting this out to all of you. Oh, and I need to drive this thing ASAP. Thanks for watching guys, hope you've enjoyed. Cheers.